Hello and welcome. I'm Melissa Perry. I'm a professor of psychology and education in the social organizational psychology program here at TC. My research has explored the role of age, generational membership, and other demographic characteristics like gender, sex, race, disability, in human resource decision making, organizational behavior, and employment outcomes. I've also conducted research exploring the impact of diversity training and sexual harassment awareness training. And it is really my great pleasure to engage in a conversation today with our TC alumna, Pamela Newkirk. Um, Pamela is a professor of journalism and the author of the book, Diversity Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, which exposes the decades old practice, uh, practices and attitudes that have made diversity a lucrative business while really failing to realize diversity. We'll be answering some of the questions you submitted in advance. And also we welcome your participation in the conversation, which you can do by using the chat feature. Pamela, um, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, there are many terms. I wanted to start off by saying many terms that people use when they're talking about diversity, DEIA, inclusion. And I thought maybe it might be helpful to start by asking you how you think about the word diversity, what that means to you and how you thought about it as you wrote that book. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today, even if it's virtual. I, I hope one day we can, we can actually meet in person. So yeah, um, that gets at part of the problem with uh, DEI work is that the term diversity has been stretched to mean so much that it almost means nothing. Um, it, it can mean race and it can mean sexual orientation. It can mean gender. It can mean physical and mental capacity. It can mean so many things that um, the reason why in my book I focus on racial diversity is because I think it has been eclipsed by the many other categories that <laughs> um, the diversity encompasses. And I think that those, um, those things have not only eclipsed race, but it seems as if they don't include race. Um, <laughs> that as if a, a, a person, a, a woman cannot also be of color, as if a person <laughs> with uh, mental or physical uh, challenges can't be of color. So, you know, those, those terms, um, we need to be really clear what it is we're talking about because these days institutions can be considered diverse and have almost no racial diversity. That's a really interesting point that you raise, which I think is getting at the issue of intersectionality, which I think we're having more and more discussion around in organizations. And I think that's a really important point that you bring um, to this conversation. Um, one of the things that occurred to me as I read through um, your book and the title of your book was just thinking about a lot of times um, as a researcher, it's really hard to gain entree to organizations when it comes to diversity related issues. Right. Um, but all organizations are very forthcoming about what they're doing or transparent. So I was curious, how did you collect the information that you did, the data that you did in order to write your book? Did you right. find it easy, easy, challenging? What was your process? Yeah. So at the outset, what I wanted to look at, I mean, first of all, I, I came at this after having spent so much of my career working in newsrooms. So I knew that journalism had a major diversity problem and then i've spent the last 25 plus years in the academy and i knew there was a diversity problem <laughs> in the academy and then i wanted to look more broadly at every influential field and what i found is that there was a diversity problem everywhere whether we were talking about science and technology or fashion and film it, it just didn't matter where we looked and so initially um, the numbers i use i look at i looked at census data i looked at um you know just employment data to see had the needle moved over the 50 years that diversity had become a preoccupation in American in the American workplace. And so that's the initial data that I looked at. And then, um, as you know, it, many institutions are not very transparent about their numbers, even though 
it, the data is collected. And so in that way, I um, to do case studies, I looked at companies for whom there were real numbers. Um, one of the companies that I profiled is Coca-Cola because they had been sued <laughs> for um, the lack of racial diversity and then uh, came up with a system of very transparent metrics. And it's a case study that I think many institutions could find useful because it charts the way it moved from being a company that where um, people of color were not represented, particularly in management, and over the course of five years showed all that was done to move it to um, a, a more diverse and inclusive space. And so, but without those transparent metrics, of course, you cannot you cannot see where the problems lie, so you can't see where the interventions need to occur, right? Right. So which leads me to my next question as you're speaking, makes me think about, could you or did you identify themes between those organizations that you would consider were doing a better job um, as differentiated from what the organizations that you thought were not doing as a good job? What, what separated those organizations? Yeah. So even if we only looked at Coca-Cola, so, um, you know, when they were sued, uh, it was found that African Americans were making less than their peers, even in the same roles. It showed that they were um, not represented at the higher levels of the organization. Um, and it also showed women were having a problem um, moving up the chain. So they came up with a system where they could look at employees across every category. They uh, based on race, based on gender, um, based on roles. And so they looked at uh, data points, including how much people were making to see if there was bias uh, along racial or gender lines. Um, they looked at um, hiring, what the candidate pools looked like. What So they looked at every, every way that you could determine bias in, in hiring and promotions and bonuses and all of the ways that an institution shows how it values its employees. And once they had that transparency, they could see where they needed to do the interventions, where bias had metastasized in unequal pay, unequal promotions, unequal hiring. And right. once they had that like very transparent way of looking at problems, they were able to intervene in real time. So before a final decision was made in hiring, they would look at, well, was the was the candidate pool diverse? Was the so they looked at every single way you could measure bias and they disrupted those patterns in real time. And so as you can imagine, that took intention. It took leadership, it took time, and it took a system um, because, you know, bias metastasizes in a system. And so you can undo that systematically. Uh, you can dismantle um, the, the systemic bias, and, but it takes that kind of intention. Yeah. Uh, what it sounds like you're um, saying, if I can extrapolate, is that the only way to really address this effectively is to really think about racism as a systemic problem. And perhaps maybe the organizations that are doing this better, like Coca-Cola, are really thinking about where it occurs throughout the system, as opposed to doing a piecemeal approach. Exactly. One point of differentiation that you found is that there are organizations that sort of take off a small bite, and then there are organizations that really think about the whole system. Right. And I mean, what I found in my research is that most organizations, even those that hire DEI professionals, they don't even grant them access to the data. So they can't even look under the hood <laughs> to see where the problems lie. And only with that kind of transparency can you hope to disrupt those patterns uh, of bias. Right, that makes uh, a lot of sense. And I think it would make a lot of sense to my colleagues who really think about um, these kinds of issues in systemic terms. So I appreciate that. Yeah, because uh, can I just add that? I think that many times the problem is people don't recognize 
this kind of bias in the way that it <laughs> lives in, in our institutions. And so they think that this problem will go away like sort of by osmosis, but it won't. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to address it is to actually lean into it and to to see very clearly where the patterns are in, in, in the system and then, you know, go about the work of, of dismantling. Yeah, that makes me think of a term in um, the research that I study around sexual harassment, uh, the difference, trying to differentiate between bad apples and bad barrels, right? If you don't address the barrel, it's... <laughs> Exactly. So it feels like that might be a way, you know, uh, a metaphor here. So curious to know whether you found anything that really surprised you in your research for this book. Was there anything yeah. that you really shocked or surprised by? Yeah, I think the thing that surprised me the most, um, besides the fact that um, the problem was far worse than I had anticipated at the outset, but I, I think the thing that I found most counterintuitive is that the the fields that we consider the most progressive um whether we're talking about you know film and hollywood or fashion or you know the arts or museums are the least diverse and corporate america is the most diverse so that i didn't anticipate you know because we think of corporate america as you know far more conservative and we think of fields yeah. like fashion and film is so progressive but those are the least diverse fields and i think um part of it uh, is what we just touched on is that people believe that because they're good people that it will all work out <laughs> so they're not looking at the way bias happens um and, and it's really partly human nature like who do we hire we hire who we know we hire who our friends know and oftentimes people of color are not in that you know that system um they're they're not thought of they're not considered and in these fields in the more creative fields where you have far more nepotism corporate america has anti-nepotism clauses for example in those fields that rely more on nepotism and these small circles of of social spheres um that is where you have the least diversity that's really fascinating. I never really thought about, I mean, I think about the role of, of industry in um, sexual harassment and, and racism, but I never really thought about this. You're making a, a point about a differentiating industries that are creative where there are, where the way work gets done is more through social networks, interpersonal right. relationships in a way, as opposed to systems and structures. Exactly. Where there are systems and structure, structures, you can at least try to right. mitigate bias in a, in a more intentional way exactly so that's a really interesting observation yeah, and it's not not what i anticipated yeah that's a really i find that really fascinating um so in, i some of the work i do is has more recently looked at how a lot of how uh hr activities are taken up used to be centralized among an hr department and they're really being pushed down to line managers, people who are on the ground who have more of a, you know, a relationship with the people who they manage. And I'm curious if what you think the role is of, you know, um, do you think that affects how bias happens? Like who's responsible for these HR activities, whether that happens in a more centralized way or a decentralized way? Yeah, I found it strange. Um, um, my background is not in organizational um, behavior, but what I found strange is that DEI work is sort of like marginalized. It's not seen as something that is at the heart of HR. <laughs> which is very strange. Um, and and um, I, I also found that uh, DEI people, professionals, are the most marginalized people in the, in the structure of most institutions. And no matter how big their title is, no matter how much money they make, <laughs> they are among the most marginalized people in, in the organization. So um, I, I didn't look specifically at HR, but I did see that DEI is not considered part of the HR <laughs> structure. Um, in one organization that I that I went into to speak, I, I found it really stunning that um, the head of HR did not have a clue as to how to better diversify her staff. And I was like, well, 
what, you know, what kind of outreach are you doing? And it got to the problem of um, this kind of cyclical nature um, that I spoke of, you know, people hiring who they know, who's mm -hmm. recommended. It's very secular. It's very enclosed. Mm -hmm. I mean, many of the people are coming through word of mouth, through recommendations mm -hmm. from colleagues, from peers. And so I said, well, have you thought about expanding the outreach that you're currently doing? Because she said she doesn't get candidates of color in the food chain, but there was no effort, no outreach to move beyond those circles of influence that had already, you know, kind of metastasized in, in, in the structure. So, yeah, so that's what I observed about HR, that it did not really see itself as a part of the DEI conversation. Right. That's so if it is being taken up by certain organizations like a Coca-Cola, where does it where is it starting? Where who is taking it up and when the organizations that you see doing a good job? Well, at Coca-Cola in particular, I, I think because it was a landmark discrimination lawsuit and because there was um, there were outside watchdogs looking at it, it became an institutional priority. And so it was really top down. I mean, the CEO, the board, um, there was so much transparency. So even though the person uh, who was charged with getting it done, uh, you know, was a, a, he worked in DEI, he was really central, he was pulled into the, the core of the operation. It was not a marginalized um, role that he, that he played. It's the only way. Um, there, there's no way that a DEI person can do this work without the full buy-in of this, the, the top person. Because what I found that first and foremost, when you have a diversity problem, you have a leadership problem. Um, and, and oftentimes leaders are farming out the problem to others, to consultants, to you know, DEI people to they're not they're not owning it as their own issue, and right. and the only way you ever see change is when the leader takes charge of the of the situation. So that's a nice transition to the next question, which is so what's going to make these what what's going to lead to organizational change? And one thing that you identified is when there's an external force like a lawsuit or <laughs> yeah. a threat. Yes. Uh, that will get leadership's attention. But from where you're sitting, is there are there other, um, I guess, forces beside the law that intervene to inspire change? Yeah, well, unfortunately, in, in our society, every time we've made progress on issues of race, there was some outside force, whether mm -hmm. it was Civil War, <laughs> when we then got Reconstruction, uh, whether it was the tumultuous, um, you know, 1960s with urban unrest and the civil rights movement, and then we made monumental change, um, you know, beginning with um, President Johnson's Great Society programs, and we saw the needle move in ways that we hadn't since Reconstruction. We saw African Americans and other people of color pulled into the main of American life, entering fields that they had historically been excluded from, uh, whether we're talking about academia or journalism. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we saw this like great, you know, historic movement. And then came the 80s and a backlash to that progress. Um, in, in, you know, under the Reagan administration, you know, we, we start, we started to hear things like reverse discrimination and something that continues to resonate in society. So every time there's been great progress, there's, it's always met by a virulent backlash. And so yeah. for the past eight years or so, we lived in a backlash <laughs> to, yeah. to the progress that, that had been made. So, I mean, the good news is that when there's will and intention, we can make monumental strides as we did in Reconstruct during Reconstruction, as we did during the Civil Rights Movement. 
Um, yeah. we, it, we, when there was will and intention, we, we changed the game, right? We, we brought people mm -hmm. in and then a backlash. And now we have this movement, Black Lives Matter. We had, you know, the horrific uh, scene of, of, of George Floyd essentially being executed on a street in broad daylight. And now we have the, the same kinds of sensitivities that we had in the 1960s that brought about change and progress. So here we are again at, yeah. at, at this, this moment of reflection uh, it, at this inflection point where mm -hmm. we yet again have an opportunity to to look at where we are, it, 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 like take off those rose-colored glasses, you know, that many people had that we we're post-race, that, you know, we, we've already conquered those issues. The mm -hmm. numbers tell a different story. The numbers mm -hmm. tell us that, yes, we had made tremendous strides after the 1960s through the 1970s, but since the 1980s, we started to slide back. And the needle has barely moved since. Yeah. It, it, what you're saying is to me that so it's the concerning part is it, it takes an external shock that's usually outside the control of people and organizations. And because yeah. after and they have to respond to those shocks. So I suppose my question, which is is I'm, I'm trying to formulate an answer for myself, is what would you, what advice would you give corporate leaders? You know, absent being the, you know, these external shocks are sort of up outside of their control and they're reactionary, but what, what would be your yeah. advice to corporate I, leaders? Yeah, I think for corporate leaders, it's, it's some, some um, soul searching <laughs> on their yeah. part. Like, are you doing it for uh, PR, you know, or, or are you doing it because it's the right thing to do? And I think too often, the actions that we've seen corporate leaders take in moments like this have been window dressing, right? Um, they almost do, it's like the same dance. You have a public uh, embarrassment, um, some revelation about, you know, something race related or gender related on your team. You hire a diversity um, professional and you issue a press release that you hired this person <laughs> this is going to change everything and then a couple of years go by things quiet down nothing changes you go back to those same organizations the needle is just where it was i i think there has been more attention to those gestures than there have been to the actual work and it's why We've seen billions of dollars spent every year on diversity effort mm -hmm. without seeing anything change <laughs> in the organization because so much of the attention is on the gestures and not on the actual work of, of dismantling bias within these organizations. It can be done. Um, there are models, uh, they, you know, but there has to be a real commitment to change. And that is what we really have not seen in 50 mm -hmm. years, that true commitment to change. We see the pledges, the press releases, the gestures, we, but we're not seeing the needle move. Right. And so I suppose that leads us as, or, as an organizational psychologist to think about what we can do as coaches as consultants to have leaders take this up in a really meaningful, authentic way. And that's, that's a daunting thing to think about how to, how to do. Yeah, it is because, I mean, I think one of the most sobering things that, um, that diversity professionals take away from my work is that nothing that they themselves will do can change this, that if it's yeah. not, um, a true mission of that organization that they work in, it's not going to happen. And um, it's why you have such a high turnover of diverse, diversity professionals who make good money in these organizations. Many times they're, they're snatched up. They have no training in diversity. It's because they're a woman or they're of color. It's like, oh, you'll do. <laughs> um, it, it, people are not recognizing that what it takes to move the needle. Um, you, you have to have access to 
the leadership, you have to have the resources, you have to have the transparent metrics, um, you have to be able to see where, you know, you need to, 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 you know, put your energies. But oftentimes what companies want and what they do is diversity training. They do what they consider quick and easy. It's yeah. like, they, they, you know, it's like this two-step. It's like, we hire this person, we do this training, we're done. We're good. We're trained. Yeah. We're, 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 we're ready to go. But what have you done? Um, yeah. Oftentimes the training does little more than trigger a backlash within mm-hmm. the organization. Um, so, you know, what I would say to um, diversity professionals is that they need to also become more realistic about what their role is uh, and, and, and they need to better assess, are they, will they be able to successfully do their job in the way that the organization is set up? Yeah. You know, can they have conversations with the leaders? Are they right. seeing these metrics? Are they able to intervene when they see patterns of bias metastasizing? But what I'm, what I'm hearing over and over is we don't even see those numbers. We don't see right. them. Right. So I'm just going to pivot just for a second because you're, you know, having this conversation makes me think how hard change is. We all know change is really hard and that leaders are critical part of the equation. But I'm wondering if you've um, given some thought to what we as um, organizational citizens can do differently. And I, and I agree with you about diversity training, right? It's often necessary, but not sufficient for change, right? It has to be, a, a, as you said before, more intentional, connected to um, all parts of the organizational system. And oftentimes it's just a little, a box that's checked. Yeah, so- because ironically, you know, the answer to diversity is diversity. In, in other words, diversity training does not make people more receptive to diversity. It oftentimes triggers a backlash, as I, as I noted. Um, there's a, a Harvard study that really shows just how that, <laughs> that happens, how um, one study showed that um, five years after diversity training, that the percentage and number of Black women and Asian women and men in management actually drops. So diversity training doesn't do the job the way that people will become better um, acclimated to diverse environments is to actually have one, to actually work yeah. in, <laughs> in an organization where there are people of different in very various roles, not all like in the mail room, not all in the, we, we have to have real diversity. And that is the, because we live in such a rigidly segregated society, many white Americans don't really have meaningful contact with people of color. And that's Mm -hmm. why there's this unease, there's this hesitation, people don't know how to act. Diversity training won't change that. What will change that is having true interactions with people (laughs) of color who are peers, right? And, yeah. and, and so it's it's one of those times where where the cure is the the thing <laughs> that, right. that that you need, you know, that right. that you don't have. Yeah, I appreciate that because uh, you know, as we've talked about, this is a very, you know, it's it's a stubborn, which is an understatement. It, yes. it, it's it feels like Groundhog Day a lot. <laughs> we've been in these yeah. conversations before, and I know these convers- conversations are so circular in nature. Yeah. In, yeah. in uh, nature, which is why I wrote the book, because I'm tired of the same conversation. <laughs> it's like, yeah. how do we get beyond these really tired and tiresome conversations that don't get us anywhere? How do we disrupt that and mm-hmm. actually um, talk about something else? Like we're seeing change. We're actually mm-hmm. doing something about this stubborn problem. Right. So your book in its own way is uh, meant to be an external shock <laughs> in turn, into our consciousness to sort of try to have a different conversation than we've been right. having. To look at what we've done over the past 50 years, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what we can do if we are serious about moving forward. Right. 
I appreciate that. I, I think it might be a nice time to um, answer some of the questions that the audience has. So um, I know that some of those, uh, some of you have had an opportunity in the audience to ask some questions and we're happy to have um, Pamela and I can address those. We can try. <laughs> well, and we will do our best. So first question, um, from an audience member, how do we think the current climate, this new era, and I should, you know, I think it's, I think, I don't know what particular aspect of the climate, this new era that has included hashtag me too and a racial reckoning will impact the advancement of diversity in the near future? Well, I think in the short term, it, it, it we're seeing some evidence that um, institutions are making greater strides uh, and, and some of it is not just lip service. We're seeing people hired in roles that they had not traditionally been hired in, whether it's at museums or in media or academia. Uh, you know, but I, I would just note we've seen this before. It, it's welcome, but I, I hope it's 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 not just a moment that it's a true movement uh, for change that will continue beyond the media's attention to it <laughs> because we we have a tendency you know we have short memories and we have a tendency mm -hmm. once the media moves on you know yeah and and the light is off of it the, the movement stops you know it just occurs to me that the me too movement gained a lot of traction in the industry that you said is struggling quite a lot with um, diversity which is the entertainment industry you know yeah. So I think that's kind of interesting. And, and I would just add to what you said, which is that this is um, these are shocks, maybe small shocks. There have been shocks in the past and it's what we do with them that seems to be the most important piece. Right. But I think they do serve um, to get us at least in a conversation again that sometimes we, we stop having because it moves to the back of our mind as opposed to the front of our minds. Right. And we also have this, the perception that things are better and things are like, we're good. We're good on yeah. gender. We're good on race. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Other conversations. Yeah. And as if we can't think of, for instance, um, gender LGBTQ issues and think of uh, race and think of gender, like we, we have the capacity <laughs> to, to yeah. juggle all of that, but we, we act as if we don't. Yeah, so that's, this is a nice um, segue, your comment to another question from the audience, which is, are we seeing a stall primarily in the advancement of people of color, or is this still an issue affecting women, LGBTQ, and people with disabilities at the same rates as it does race or even age? Yeah, I, I think um, race is the is the piece that has been overshadowed, as I said in, in, in at the very outset, and it's because you know we move on, and and you know especially during the Obama years, there was this perception in society that we've conquered the racial problem. And so we turned our attention away from race, and as we did, we saw this backsliding, and we saw. Um, you know, African Americans and Latinos actually start losing ground, um, and, and and no one was paying attention because we were supposedly post race, <laughs> and 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 so I, I think um, while we saw women make greater strides during these years, we saw um, people of color, particularly African Americans and Latinos, lose ground, and so that's why we have to be more mindful of of race. Um, as we're mindful of gender and 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 you know LGBTQI, um, we we have to still um, keep our eye on race because it's been one of America's most persistent <laughs> problems, right? Yeah, historically, yeah. absolutely. I think that's a, a deeply ingrained in our history as a country. I mean, obviously, exactly. Yeah. Another question, um, how can we make an impact in our own jobs to make our workplace culture more inclusive and understanding of why diversity is important? I mean, you know, this is an issue that each person in an organization can play a role in. Um, when we're thinking about candidates for jobs, when we're thinking about outreach, when we're thinking about who's being systematically excluded 
what is our role in that, right? Um, like we all want to work around our friends and the people in our social spheres, but we can also think of the ways that we can um, include greater outreach in, in to make our, our workplaces more diverse. So in, in those like little um, ways, um, you know, each person can help disrupt these patterns that we see. Right, and I think your comment before is that if it doesn't happen at the top, it's not, it doesn't, it, it, it almost, it's not gonna really happen. But to your point, I think one of the things that um, we can do is, is try to, I like your word disrupt, um, disrupt, people's, disrupt people's thinking about, for example, what, what is successful performance look like? Right. What does successful applicant look like? Right. Um, what are the standards by which we're judging people? And Right. We have these embedded ideas about yeah. what success looks like, what a professional right. looks like, right? And, and right. all that has to change. But, you know, it, it, I'm thinking, too, of something that we haven't discussed, and it's probably the way we can move the needle most, and that's through mentoring. Um, but, but what I found is that in many organizations, because of the awkwardness around race, people of color are not sufficiently mentored. And no one succeeds in a competitive environment without mentoring. And, yeah. and so if institutions began to set up like real mentor, mentoring programs, not just for people of color, everyone should be mentored. But mm -hmm. the problem is, People of color often don't get mentoring because people don't know, um, as one woman said in the organization that she hadn't really talked to any of her African-American colleagues and she had worked there five years. And I said, well, why? And she said, I don't know what to say. And I said, how about hello? <laughs> and how, how are you? But that is where we are. And and that that is what... Um, it is is causing retention problems if people yeah. are alienated isolated treated like martians and not like colleagues <laughs> that creates these these environments these toxic environments for for yeah. people of color so that the, the retention problem fuels the diversity problem right right it also makes me think that in um in sexual harassment um, awareness interventions. They talk a lot about how, of course, having a climate that's supportive is important, but also increasingly recognizing the role of allyship. What people who are working with or um, men mentoring are um, in relationships with people, what they can do in their own roles. Mm -hmm. and so I think to your point, mentoring is a um, can be a job focused way of having a relationship. And allyship is a different kind of relationship that you can have with people in your organizational um, atmosphere, in your in your um, unit or uh, wherever it is you work. So I think that's a really, it's interesting to sort of think about the tools that organizations have potentially available. And if they don't, what we can take up on our own and um, right. we can engage in informal mentoring, you know, we can make a choice to do that. It doesn't have to be a formal arrangement. Exactly. Right. It yeah. can be, but, but, you know, it's interesting. I, I spoke it was at an insurance company and one of the executives, he asked, well, as a white man, can I mentor an African-American employee? And I'm just like, what is you, <laughs> what, what does you being a white man have to do with your ability to mentor mm -hmm. a, a colleague? And so we have to kind of break out of this this um, box that that we put ourselves in um, mm -hmm. that you know you're not dealing with a Martian <laughs> you're dealing you're dealing with a fellow American uh, wow. you know a person who probably has more in common with you than you think um, yeah. they, they're trying to pay the rent or the mortgage and trying to find the best schools for their children and uh, mm -hmm. But but because we don't go to church together, we often don't go to school together. So all people know about African Americans is often what they see on television and in movies, and that's the most stereotyped and and usually you know um, unflattering portrait of a people. And yeah. and so the only way out of this is we have to somehow you know, 
break through the, these these self-constructed barriers that 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 we've created and just reach across you know yeah. chasm and, and and see who people really are yeah that's uh, that's very powerful thought right is it, it i think what you're talking about in addition to any you know systemic segregation we self-segregate and that's that gets in the way definitely and it's easy to other people because you just don't have experience or information about what other people's people in other groups are like or right who they are. And, so. and those people will never succeed in environments where they're not pulled in. They will yeah. never you can't. It's 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 right. it's rigged, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. That's a nice metaphor, right? Like pulling people in or across or right them the mic or you know things <laughs> like that right yeah. mm -hmm. great um, another question from an audience member do we think we'll see all these diversity initiatives this whole industry as you refer to it declining or growing in the near future well all the evidence shows that it's growing and i just hope it grows in the right way because you don't need a bloated diversity apparatus to fix this problem it, you know you need things that, you know, you don't even need the word diversity. You need just institutions that are committed to fair and equal access to promotions, to opportunity, to, um, and, 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 you know, you need people who are already, that is their role, whether it's the HR person, or if you have a mentoring program. I mean, you already have within your institutions <laughs> um, the mechanism for change. They just have to be applied to this issue. Um, but instead we have this overlay like the, and, and we make, we turn it into this bloated thing because it, it, which is an acknowledgement that we can't, we can't do it. <laughs> we need something else. We can't just do it as part of our, organization it's almost like we want to make it overly complicated and it's already exactly. yes it's like because oh, then we have a good reason for why nothing happens because it's too hard it, right. right right and the only thing that's hard is what we're doing we're making it hard because yeah. we're still wrestling with the idea of it like is this truly what we want do we want like what does excellence look like and are, can an organization that reflects the diversity in the population truly be excellent? And I think we're still wrestling with that idea. And that goes back to, you know, all of the ideas that have been bedded in American society yeah. for 400 years about right. notions of racial superiority and racial inferiority. And so we're living in this toxic pool <laughs> and, yeah. and and without recognizing the yeah. ways in which it has an impact on just about every decision that we make yeah. Around, yeah. around these issues. So unless we lean into it and we recognize how it is literally coloring the way we function in society and how mm -hmm. that you know, um, affects how we hire, how we promote, how we pay, how all of these decisions are coming out of these embedded ideas that we still have not sufficiently grappled with. Yeah. So the last question um, for us, for you, uh, it seems that in order to be a competitive job candidate, a graduate degree is increasingly becoming a requirement for many roles that are not that senior. How will this impact the pipeline of candidates? Will we see even less people of color in the talent pool? Well, because every field has a diversity problem, including graduate school, <laughs> um, it could. But on the flip side, you know, in many organizations, it would take so little to create diversity. And if you only looked at Ivy Leagues, for example, to increase diversity. If you only looked at the at candidates in graduate schools, you can move the needle. You know, there, there are students coming out of the best schools in this country, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Columbia. Uh, MIT. If you only look there, you can move the needle on this problem. 
Yeah. But because they, they're usually in small places, it's why corporate America is more diverse because they have a, a, a wider network that they tap into. And yeah. the more elite institutions are looking at in really small spheres. But if they only look at the very top, they could still make a difference because they're, they're candidates of color in all of these schools. They are professional networks of color. They're, they're, so they are all of these, um, these, these networks that are not being tapped. Yeah. I think for me, when I think about that question, it raises a more fundamental question, which we sort of touched on, which is how do we define what success looks like in any given job? And I think that um, sometimes we just slap a label on, we, well, this job now needs a higher level of education. And that's an easy thing to say without thinking about what does this job um, require in terms of, you know, behavior, be, you know, personality. Um, exactly. That may or may not be captured by a graduate degree. You know, that's, the graduate that's degree is a proxy sometimes for information that, um, is harder to divine in five minutes from a piece of paper. That's true. And, you know, but there are all of these perceptions about what excellence looks like, right? And part of it is like these graduate degrees. And yeah. but there's also the perception of um, class when it comes to race. There's this presumption that if you hire African-American or Latino, they come from a different background, a different class, as if African-Americans are also not <laughs> from the upper echelons of, you know, the social order. It, so we, we conflate race with class, with ability, with all kind of this whole stew, right? Yeah. That, that has been not just concocted by us, but it was kind of fed to us. It came from on high, from the greatest institutions, right? Um, right told us that there was this racial hierarchy and, mm -hmm. and it's been embedded in the academy from the very beginning. Right, right. And the academy, we're gatekeepers in many ways, right? In terms exactly, and I have, mm -hmm. and it, very few institutional leaders have publicly addressed the, the role that they have played in the perpetuation of this racial ideology that is behind our diversity problem. And that's until right. that's done, I mean, we, we, we have a long road ahead of us to, to recognize the, the role these deeply embedded ideas yeah. has played and continues to play in the way our society is structured. Who gets arrested for marijuana? Who gets stopped by the police? Who you know, is it is hired for a job? Who, what is excellence, right? Yeah, I think that might be a great way to bookend our conversation because I think what you're suggesting is um, it would be useful if we hold, all hold the mirror. And by hold the mirror, I don't even mean just in our in our pe people, but our institutions. You know, as a, you know, as as a professor in a program in an elite institution. We all need to hold the mirror and think about the role we play and uh, the stubbornness and uh, and what we can do as potential disruptors. Yes. So I've really enjoyed this conversation. It was great to meet you. Um, your oh, bye. is a wonderful external shock, and I mean that in the most positive way. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, will help us move the needle in terms of our thinking and having conversations that can be more meaningful and maybe impactful and. It's been a pleasure to be in conversation with you today. I really enjoyed it. Pleasure was, pleasure was mine. Thank you. Thank you.